do that at the time. Okay. Um, so, we stop on page 57, no Janae today. Leo's at the party. And no Zoe today. Your sight was surviving the day of that today, yes. That's true. Where's you two at the party? So it's going to be a bad day with Dr. Day. But, but good day is here, so it's going to be a good day. Right, exactly. Right. 37-59. Because there is so much uh, well, no, the complexity, so much back and forth, so much so much difference, but also some points of overlap between Ascanius and Cicero. Um, even though you've read through these two pages, uh, the questions last night really helped to bring some of that uh, and, and to understand them. So, um, question number one. According to, this is page 57, uh, according to Cicero, why was Milo unhappy in the way? First half of question number one, Ms. Runyon. To a point of freeze. Then he will do right. Second half, does this agree with Asconius's account? And they tell you that's back in chapter 57, lines 1 through 3. You can actually go back there and look at it. In fact, do keep your finger on page 49, which is Asconius's account in 57, and Cicero's account. So keep your finger on 49 and 57 so you can go back and forth. Uh, somebody else gets the second half. Ron, you got the first half. Second half of the question, does this agree with Asconia? Jacob? Yes, it agrees with Asconia. Not only does it agree with him, and I think we pointed this out at the time, uh, look at the language in line 2 and 3, page 49. It's the same words. Uh, in fact, it's not just the same words. It's the same words in the same order. Ad flaminem from them. All right. No, we got to pause on that. Yeah. Can we assume that, that Asconius got that from Cicero's actions? Shut the front door. That's exactly where we were going with that. Oh my God. Exactly right. Why do you say it that way? Uh, well, I mean, like, if you're writing, like, an essay or, like, a report about, like, or a history about some, something, right. you typically will, like, quote a source. Okay, quote a source. And, yeah, Andrew? It's easy to pick up on that. And which one came first? Cicero. Cicero. So definitely be Asconius quoting Cicero. Now, pause on this, all right? So a little bit of grammar review. Can't pass an opportunity for this. So you got some guy who perfectus est. Now, we've got a grand total of one, two, three, four ways to say that the guy set out to appoint a priest. We've got four different ways that either Cicero or Esconius could have said that. Start off with your most basic one. What would be the most basic way early in second year Latin, early in first semester of second year Latin, Maxwell? Purpose clause. Purpose clause would be your easiest way. So, how would you start that off as a purpose clause? In fact, go ahead and actually copy this out. I want you to uh, actually see the uh, parallel constructions here. So, you start it off with what? You start it off with ut. Okay. Uh, appoint what? Appoint a priest. So, priest is going to be in what case? Accusative. All right. So, the word for priest is flamen, flaminus, neuter. In, I'm sorry, masculine. Uh, in this instance, flamen, flaminus. Uh, so, what would the accusative form be? Yep. Flaminem. Flaminem. Because, it is, I want to clench it now. Third to clench it now. And we want to say to a point, so we're going to use the verb prodo, prodera, which literally is do dare, it's a compound to literally. To, to give forth or to set forth. 
So he set out to appoint a priest. What form of a verb are you going to want here, Drew? Okay, that's true. Yeah, I'm thinking about it in terms of the Latin, though. Oh. Uh, what form are you going to want in a purpose clause? Maxwell. Subjunctive. You don't want a subjunctive. And if I remind you, or you tell me, what tense is perfect assessed? What tense is perfect assessed? Somebody out of Maxwell. You can't be Atlas and carry the world on his shoulder. Yeah, she knew. It was saying that asked by itself would be present. But when combined with the last part of the verb, perfect as has to be perfect. perfect. So that puts us in which sequence? It's all good to review. We're in Second. secondary Second. sequence. So for a purpose clause, what are your two choices for a subjunctive in a purpose clause secondary sequence? Eric? Perfect or pluperfect. Imperfect or pluperfect. Which one do you think we need here? Just first of all, let's get that in. Do we want imperfect or pluperfect? Well, how do we know? Imperfect. Because what you're really saying is he set out so that he might, might appoint a priest. What you're really when you say to appoint a priest, what you're really saying at that deep level is so that he might appoint a priest. Now, which how are we going to make that imperfect subjunctive off of proto Jacob? Uh, second plus. Yep. T, there it is. Yeah, it passes. So there you go. So get that one down. That would be your present. That would be your purpose clause. He could have said it that way. Either Asconius or Cicero could have done it that way. Yeah. To a point. Yeah. All right. Now, give me another way. Again, this is this time of year, last year, and second year. Another way to express purpose besides the plain old purpose clause, Sheena. Let's go genitive of purpose. Okay. Genitive of purpose, you're going to start off with either of what two clue words, Drew? Causa or gratia. Your choice, you could use causa or gratia. Okay. Now we need everything in the genitive. So we need priest in the genitive. How are you going to do priest? There's a third declension. In fact, I'm going to suggest you don't even need to think about it. Rania. Flaminous. You just take the second dictionary entry. Exactly right. Flaminous. Now, what part of speech typically goes in with a genitive of purpose? It won't be a subjunctive verb, and it's not going to be Maxwell to answer. Leo? Uh, gerundive. Very nice. So we need a genitive gerundive from proto. You know it's going to involve an ND. What do you think? Wait, can you explain why that is? Sure. Because actually the next three that we're going to do all involve either a, gen, um, a gerund or a gerundum. Okay. That's just kind of, that's part of, just like a, a subjunctive is part of the purpose clause, these others just naturally use a, a gerund or gerundum. Right. Beautiful. Prodendi. Causa flaminus prodendi. You could say. That would have been fun. All right. Another way to do purpose. We've had purpose clause and we've had genitive of purpose. Give us another way. Not you, not you. We're going to push people out of word work. Not you. Reagan. Do you use more of the clause? Can't use a clean clause for purpose. The clean clause will show cause uh, or circumstance or something that's kind of contrary, although it's raining. I went out without my umbrella. It is? Yeah. Raining. Actually, it is raining. And I did go out without my umbrella. What was that? Uh, I'm going to hold it off for number four. I just kind of want to go in case order. So, Andrew? Dative of purpose. No special helping word. We just need our words in the dative case. So think back to third declension. What's the dative singular of flamen or flamenness? If you're working off of third declension. Leo? Singular, right? Singular, yep. Close. You you went accusative. Nia. You went up one to genitive. We we're all right around it. Right around it. Sheena. Good thinking. If it were second declension, oh. that'd be exactly right. Flamini. There it is. Flamini. That's a fun word to say. Flamini. Exactly. It's a fun word to say. Flamini. Uh, 
And then same thing, we need the dative <coughs> gerundive. So I'm going to say, hope you're listening to the Sheena, because the gerundive does use second declension forms. So Emma? Prodendo. Uh, yeah, prodendo. You could have just said perfectusest flamini prodendo. That would have been fine. Or you could have done the Margaret accusative of purpose, and that's the one we had actual. Now, odd. Flaminem prodendo. All right, there's a reason for bringing all this stuff up. And it's to prove, really, pretty solidly prove Eric's point. Obviously, Asconius simply lifted the period directly from Cicero. You had all these other ways you could have expressed this. There's even other words for priest. There's other words for a point. You could have used synonyms. You could have put the words in a different order, okay? There's just some things. So, for example, I guarantee you, you have accidentally said something exactly the way President Obama said. Yeah. Just because you speak English and he speaks English, okay? That, that's going to happen. But if you wrote down on a piece of paper trying to talk about some events in the past, and you started off with four score and seven years ago, <laughs> then it would be clear, whatever the rest of your sentence was, there's no question in an English reader's mind that you lifted that phrase directly from where? Yeah. From Lincoln's yeah. Gettysburg Address. So this is not the casual kind of thing that every Roman said at at some point, right? It's the word for and, all right? That, that's nothing special. But this, yeah, he lifted that from Cicero, no question. And, and then back better. How would you say that would be confusing Flamini? Flamini Provenda? Yeah, it would just be Flamini. How do you say it? Do you know what I'm saying? It does, it does, but here's the deal. You have no problem with this sentence. You don't have any problem with those two words just because they both have the double As Those are so totally different. And yeah, I know for us, as second language learners, we're looking at that going, that looks like a verb ending. No Roman would have even remotely thought that. Just because of the context and the way they know their own language, they're not going to get confused. Yeah, Patrick. So was it like Eric said, was he doing it kind of like beside him, or was it more of like he was mocking him? I don't know that he was mocking him, either to cite him or sometimes that's just the best way to say something. And, and he just he liked that expression. It's like, you know what, that's good. There's no reason to change it. Uh, uh, or maybe he wanted to use a direct quotation. Uh, and obviously, newspapers do that. You will directly quote and then you'll also paraphrase. Yeah? So it's something that we discussed in having uh, on bringing up like the armor Sure, right, right, bringing that up as a, as a point of reference. Moving on to number two. Where does Cicero say the confrontation took place? Uh, Ms. Riggin. Just how early on? Uh, well, that was, that was at Sconius. Where does Cicero, maybe I read it wrong. Where does Cicero say the confrontation took place? Andrew. Uh, uh, I, I believe that's what Reagan just said. Um, well, and which is true, and certainly is what Asconius said, but there's an answer here they're looking for in line five. Cicero was a little more specific than, than just referencing a town. Uh, Maxwell. Does anybody see the word Bovali in line five? No. Oh, okay, so really Bovali doesn't figure into that. That's true. Again, that we're, not, not, we're not knocking that. That's true. Ron, yeah? Just before his yeah, in front of his farm. Oh. He says it took place right in front of whose farm? Oh, Clodius. Clodius's Clodius. farm. The, the confrontation took place right in front of Clodius's farm. Where's the Latin for that? Ronnie? Ante suum fundum. Ante suum fundum. Right there it is, in front of his farm. Oh, my God, we're wrong. Well, maybe that's it. Yeah, we're on page 57. We were, we were going back and forth between 49. I was like, I see both of them right there. 
I see where you're going. Okay, no, we, we were, we're uh, on 57, is what the questions are. What claim does Cicero make regarding the nature of Clodius's confrontation with Milo and the direction of line six for the answer? Emma? He said that Clodius made the initial attack. You're darn right. What did you say? It says Clodius made the initial attack. I love the way you said that because that's not directly translating, but that's clearly getting the sense out of it. Where's the Latin that backs up what she said? Somebody other than Emma who knows what she's doing. Drew. Um, Meloni Insidios Colocata. There it is. Meloni Insidios Colocata. He placed the ambush for Milo. Very nice. Uh, number Wait. four. Yeah, Eric. Wait, why was Milo at this Clodius' farm? No, he, just was, he was on the road. Oh. And the, the road just ran in front of Clodius' farm. Describe the circumstances of Clodius' departure from Rome. That's throughout line 6 through 8, so there should be quite a bit of detail here. Lauren, give us something. Um, he left this meeting early, and um, Cicero said it had to be when he wanted to create violence. There you go. He left multiple things. One, he left a, a violent meeting. He left a raucous caucus. He left a violent meeting early, and he left a violent meeting early which he never would have done unless he wanted to do something even worse. Okay? Nice. Pure, pure speculation there. Uh, top page 59. Um, we might, yeah. Put them on the Oh, sorry. No, God, that's right. Yeah, dude. that is so weird. I hate that. Questions five, six, and seven are actually back on page fifty-six. That is weird. Uh, oh, I do. Weird printing. According to Cicero, why might these circumstances be regarded as suspicious? Well, you kind of already answered that, but because why? Yeah, he never would have. He never would have left such a place. Uh, if he were out to do something else. Uh, what Latin words does Cicero use to suggest Claudius's violent tendencies? Uh, Margaret. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I think continuo, uh, continuum turbulenta, the rowdy meeting, the raucous caucus, I think that's certainly a word. I think there may be another, at least one other word. Furor. Yeah, well, all right, a couple things. Um, no, absolutely not. Uh, furor in line seven means what? Rage. Madness. Rage. Madness. Suggesting that he is really out of his mind somewhat. And then you use the word facinoris, which is what? Villainy. Crime. Villainy or crime. So you got all these, these loaded words here. All right. Let's talk about that for just a minute. There is a reason you take English classes even though you all are fluent in English. You want to build a wide vocabulary for different things and different reasons and different times. Uh, one, of the best, one of the best sources for looking at synonyms is sports writing. How many of you actually you know, read sports articles in the newspaper, sports articles or sports magazine, or watch Sports news type shows on ESPN. Any one of those. Okay, so we got a few I people. Really in oh, and what else? Maybe you read it. Sports writers are some of the best of this. Rarely will you get something so boring as North Central Heat Fire. You tend to get North Florida. Carmel went down to North Central with a last quarter shot by sorry, North Central rolled over Carmel in the third game of the series. There's all these great ways to say it. And you think about it, they all say the same thing in essence. Sure. But there's a huge difference in the field and the connotation. That Oh, uh, talking about Harry Carey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Like I just remember, I got listed at this time, but they'll make the most boring plays. Oh, like right. Ninth inning, live sports. It's live sports caster. Yeah, yeah very, very good at that sort of thing. 
Um, okay, take it to the where I'm a medicine for a moment. What do you call it? What do you refer to this skill as? When a doctor is able to present information, maybe very sad and troubling, but in a kind and gentle way. We refer to the doctor's bedside manner. You don't want the doctor coming in and saying, well, you got the results, you got cancer of the face, and you're going to die. Now well, that may be true, but you want him to cushion the blow a little bit. Well, we looked at the results, and based on our initial findings, it seems that you have melanoma. Right? It just kind of cushioned a little Now, it's still, you got cancer of the face, all right? It's still the same thing. But you wanted to cushion the blow. You can see it's gone now? I have big old Good. Good. We're glad. Yes. All right. Hey, Brennan, have the big old ugly scar. You know, I'm just saying. So, so there it is. The other place, of course, is you look at wall. Okay, so you look at these loaded words that Cicero's used. Turbulenta. Furor. Fockiness, right? He's clearly painting the opposition as this really, really bad guy. And as we saw yesterday on page 59, he paints his client as this super wonderful family man doing his responsibility for the Senate and all this kind of stuff. Page 59. I think we're ready for that, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're going to skip that. Number eight, top 59. Describe Milo's activities prior to his departure for Lanuvium. This leads us right into it. Reagan. I'd say a little before that. I'd say before that, uh, Margaret. There you go. So he was in the Senate, stayed to the end, went home to change his shoes and his clothes. Now, how many of you are in uh, uh, Mr. Armstrong's film class? You currently? Yeah. Oh, your accountant teaches it too? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. I didn't say that. I'm going to give you a hand. Oh, Anyhow, uh, <laughs> uh, um, I, I doubt that your voice picked up the microphone back there. Anyhow, but um, uh, really don't. Um, so I didn't realize there was a test and talk. Um, do you guys talk about uh, some of the really kind of the, the Director shots and, and yeah. angles and stuff like that. Yeah, we read about it. There's a, we have a book called Understanding Movies. Okay. Big Iron. Oh, 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 I've seen that book before. Right. Um, nobody's going to go watch a movie where everything is nothing but the long shot. All right, where well you're sitting out here, here's all the actors. Basically, the action just pans around, and, and you're at this huge distance. Isn't that what the play? Was that? That's be like what you're seeing with a play. Exactly. Sometimes you will see films that really do try to mimic that. They try to mimic the feeling of a play. But in an actual movie, and especially in, in modern day, you get all kinds of shots. And a lot of them are close-ups. Right? So you can just imagine this, right? You see the close-up, and all you see are feet walking down the alley, right? And it's dark. And it's built in suspense because you're focused on that little detail. Cicero so can do that with words. And those of you who have any aspirations to be a writer, or maybe you enjoy writing on your own, uh, as you're telling stories and writing characters, you're not just writing big, dramatic stuff. You then want to come in and zoom in on little stuff. And so here he's zoomed in, and everybody in that room is imagining Milo's shoes. He just brought you right down to that very humble uh, kind of detail. What humorous aside does Cicero make in line 13? Question nine, uh, Andrew. That he was waiting for his wife while she got ready. So again, good family man, good husband, good senator. Now, describe the traveling style of Clodius, according to Cicero, and compare it with that described by Asconius, and they take you back to chapter 57, lines five through nine which would be on page 49. We're comparing 49 to 59 right now. And we did a little bit of this yesterday. Uh, Delhi. Um, Julius was on horseback. Yeah, that was scary. Yeah. Okay. 
Horseback, no carriage, no wife, no greets. No uh, how does that compare with what Asconius said? Uh, Margaret. Okay, yep, Drew? Um, he lived on horseback. Yep. But he had his uh, group of slaves following him, and he wasn't allowed to more than like five years. Okay. So they both agree that he was on horseback. A little bit of a different emphasis on the traveling companions. The Scottish does admit that he had some bodyguard, and Cicero goes on and on about what he didn't have. What about number 11? Same basic question. Describe Milo's traveling style according to both authors, Cicero and Scotus. Reagan. It's about Milo. Right? Okay, yes. so Milo, according to Asconius, had like a column, like he was called a slave, and like all these like kind of military persona gladiators. And according to Cicero, he was just like traveling. He's a good little boy, and he's traveling with his wife, right? He's got his wife, he's, he's, got, nice carriage. Carriage. he's got his nice carriage, he's got his family minivan, he's even got his riding cloak on. And again, it goes into details that Asconius does not include. Uh, and so that one seems maybe a little bit more different. Yes, Margaret. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Beria, right, right. Nothing about those guys at all. Um, okay. What is a lie? Oh, that's not the definition I think most people would initially give. When you purposely withhold the truth. Now there's different ways to withhold the truth. I can withhold the truth by deliberately saying something false, or I can withhold the truth simply by not saying the truth. That was nice. That actually got both sides. Most people, I think, think about lying as a more direct thing. I tell you that 2 plus 2 is 5. I deliberately say something's false. But you got where, where I really wanted to go was the other piece of it. Cicero simply doesn't mention what Margaret brought up. That Milo had a couple of big thug gladiators in his group. He simply doesn't mention it. Is that a lie of omission? We talk about two different things. Yes. We talk about a lie of omission, and we talk about a lie of commission. Right? So if I commit the lie, right? So the lie of commission, I tell you the two plus two is false. I deliberately tell you something that is false. It's a lie of omission. Okay. Uh, and you say, you know, um, we're trying to figure out how Maxwell ended up dead. And you're dead. And uh, Mr. Franken comes in and he says, Mr. Perkins, uh, Maxwell's body is seeping into your carpet. You have to 26. Um, uh, clearly something happened there. He's dead. Uh, did you see Margaret stab him in the ear with a pencil? Yes. And my response is, okay, no, Mr. Brannigan, I did not see her stab him in his ear with a pencil. But and then I said nothing further. Now, what I did witness was Margaret strap on some brass knuckles yeah. and literally beat Maxwell's face to a pulp. <laughs> but I didn't say anything about it. I answered Mr. Brannigan's question literally. No, I did not see her stab him in the ear with a pencil. Oh, yeah. one now, back. I have really committed a lie of omission because there was clearly a relevant fact there and I didn't come forward. And it's obvious Mr. Brandon wants to get to the bottom of why one of the students is dead and bleeding out. Okay? So I've got a reason to offer up the full story and for whatever reason I held that back. That's a lie of omission. 2 plus 2 is 5, lie of commission. What's going on with Cicero? He doesn't mention the gladiators. Understand why? He wants to make it, makes his client look bad. Has he lied? 
Yes. Is it a lie of omission? You say, you would say it's a lie of omission. You would shake your hand and say, no, it's not. Talk to us. Yeah, yeah. this kind of law, what, what, what someone will tell you. Law isn't always about justice. It's about signing the law. And that's a different story. And there's a great film, and based on a book by uh, John Grisham called The Firm. It's got Tom Cruise in it and Gene Hackman. And Tom Cruise is a new attorney at this law firm. And you can tell that his mentor, his kind of boss there in the firm, is wanting him to kind of bob and weave around the law. And he says to him at one point, he says, I need to know how far you want me to bend the law. And his boss says, as far as you can without breaking. You're right. On the one hand, you don't want to condemn your own client. I mean, obviously, you don't want to. How far do you go? How far can you go? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think it is a, lot, a lie of omission, but um, I th think that lie of omission is like separate from like deliberate deliberately okay. lying. So, like, when, like, in many court cases, when they, like, say that you pledge to, like, tell the truth. Yes, right. Uh, you can point, I mean, I think the lying of omission is not really... Well, hold on, though. It's the whole truth. Thank you. When you go into a courtroom, our standard formula is, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing, nothing but the truth? They want to cover all bases, and you're right. So I think our formula there is to try to prevent you uh, from they that. they have that, that whole thing in the No, 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 certainly did not. Certainly did not. All right, moving on. Okay. Uh, demonstrate the extent of the balance and symmetry between lines 16 through 18 and 18 through 21. Rania. Um, um, oh, can I say why you need to do Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, um, so like it says, Okay. All right, so first off, now this is really nice, and I can tell right here's what he's on. So the one guy, Clodius, all right, he is sine uxore. He's without his wife. Whereas you said Milo, or Milo is what? In line 19? Cum uxore. Dead opposite. Keep going, dude. If I can tell you're on the right track. Um, well, yeah, that's kind of... Stay, stay on it. Pick up another parallel between line 16 and line 19. I see another verbal parallel there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This guy, Clodius, he is in nulla rida. He is in no carriage. Whereas Milo in line 19, in rida. He is in a carriage, okay? Um, and say, say again, Jacob. Nullus infidiensis. I would agree with that. This guy, Clodius, has nullis impedimentis. He has no baggage. And while he doesn't pick up that word exactly with, uh, with Milo here, uh, he does say, remember how he was dressed? Line 19, 20, he is high new losses. He's got the big, heavy cloak on. Okay? And then what about company? According to Cicero, Clodius was with nullis graecis comitibus. Without any Greek companions. No Greek companions. Um, I'm sorry, Comitibus. And Milo is with what? He's got this Magno. 
Komatatu. He's got this huge group of people with him. Now, uh, certainly this is with all the noise. Now that you picked up because you know that from before, you know Sister Earl likes to do that kind of thing. And I said this just in terms of your own writing. You're, unless you go into law, you're not going to be writing speeches like this. But you're going to do a lot of writing. If you're doing comparison or contrast, that's really nice. Go point for point and go in the same order if you can. So it just really helps your reader connect with that. And so he's making that huge distinction. There. Why does he employ that, Rania? Um, well, I was thinking he's kind of trying to make it seem like black and white. Absolutely. So it's like this guy is 100% wrong, and my right. guy is 100% right, instead of letting like, the literature or whatever, like the secret. Right. In real life, and this, I gotta tell you, this bottoms a lot of people. I've seen some of our best and brightest in North Central get bothered by this. When I would teach TOK. Okay. Top of the top of the GPA, right? They're getting an IB diploma. And a lot of those folks wanted it nice and clean. Black and white. Life isn't like that. Life's fuzzy. Life's messy around the edges. Uh, now maybe there's enough black or enough white that you can make a decision, but rarely is it this stark. And so I think Ryan that's exactly right. He's made, trying to make that nice smooth comparison. Uh, yeah? Uh, what is Magno? Magno Comitatu, a great group or a great assembly of people. Yeah? Can we compare life to its subjunctive tense because it's always fuzzy and not clear? Stop that! Oh uh, yes, that's exactly right. Life is not so much indicative as it is subjunctive. Okay, that should be our next Latin club trip. That could be a shirt. Again, it could be a bumper sticker. Um, like it's like the seductive tense. Always, always, never. Like so They'd be like, what is that? Say, boom! And then they'd <laughs> bump into you exactly right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Patrick. Uh, my cousin's an artist. She said something to me one time that kind of made me think about that. She said, in like real life, we can't actually make colors that are really black or white. Everything is just really dark and light shade. This is this is accurate if you think about actual uh amazing thing that's the same thing. That's good. That is really good. Now I like number fourteen because it uses the phrase parade of ablatives. <laughs> uh, how does the parade of ablatives contribute to this uh, Oh no, so so we gotta get thirteen. Uh why is his description uh, a bio's manner, uh, make his use of the word insidiator ironical. Why is it ironic for Cicero to call Milo an insidiator? Uh, we touched on it yesterday. Yes? Um, because he had described him as traveling with his wife, and then he carries in time with the cloak that the new woman can go lose fight, and a, a highwayman would need to strike quickly. He's obviously being sarcastic. He's not being literal when he says it. Oh, yeah, yeah, this, this murderer here. How does the parade of Ablevis? I want, as the next major holiday, I want to see a parade of Ablevis. Oh I think. Yeah. I don't Is know. that a long A? I don't know. Long A. <laughs> it should be a costume says accompaniment. I don't know. It should be at like Fall Latin Day. Oh my gosh, yes. Wait, it's a great idea. We have the parade of ablatives. Oh, wait, or at state convention, we can announce our North Central through a parade, parade of ablatives. Wait, are they gonna yes. Yes. Uh, and Matt Lauer would be announcing it, you know. No, and, uh, back oh, is he not? No, not back Whoever it is is announcing it. So Coming up next, we cases. have the parade of ablatives. Yeah. North Central High ablative. School <laughs> in Indianapolis. Just list right. off like all 1,782 ablatives. Right. You know. <laughs> You know, Jennifer, we haven't seen the Ablative of Accompaniment in the parade for a long time. It's good to see that back. I want to be almost a thousand years. Ablative of Means. Wait. No. Parade of Ablatives. How does that contribute to the irony? Well, all right. How does he describe this band? Komatatu's really band. So that's the best way This band of uh, slaves. Well, he uses all these ablatives, magno, impedito, mulievri, delicato. How does all that really enhance the irony? Yes, Leo. Like, 
Totally harmless. Obviously, this guy's no threat to anybody. Uh, and so didn't really emphasize that. Of course, they didn't ask this, but with et, et, op, you've got another example of? Tricolon. That's what tricolon is. But, oh, hey, good. Oh, oh right. word. Oh. It was big, and it was this, and it was just going on and on and on, and really drawing it out, and again, making it seem slow and ponderous. Okay? So is that like the opposite of an ascent then? It's, it's, it's the exact opposite of us. Yeah, exact opposite. Uh, why would his, why would Insidiator more appropriately apply to Clodius, given Cicero's description? Leo. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's the idea to plant it in people's minds. Uh, you plant stuff in people's minds. Um, all right, good deal. Uh, we find out the end of this tomorrow, Wednesday. Tomorrow's Wednesday. Tomorrow's Wednesday. Finish this up. Thursday is your, wait a minute. Wait, tomorrow's our gallery. Tomorrow is our gallery. Yeah. So, yeah, tomorrow's our gallery. We also have a few lines to finish up, so we've got a little bit of that, a little bit of art gallery. Are we going to do the art gallery in here? You get new books on Thursday. So yellow books come back, and then new books on Thursday. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Patrick got the good derivative. Insidious comes from Insidious. Uh, Elliot, if you would, the camera, please. Yes. Uh, or, like, if you wanted to do multimedia, how can we convert that to a uh, either if some of you can upload to YouTube, uh, or a private link, you can do that, or in a flash drive, or, or whatever. Can multimedia still be a drawing? No. Check your car out. Unless it's a flash drive. Mixed media. Unless it's a flash drive. Unless it's like one of those little flip book things, you take a little video. Not in this, not in this.